part of the miracle of the Israeli tech scene throughout the years is even more impressive when you understand how small of a group it is. Israel ultimately is about 8 million people these days, out of which almost a million people is above the age of 65. The population here under the age of 22, 23 is also pretty big, around 2.5 million people, 3 million people. So they don't participate in the workforce, they don't participate in the creative class, as you would call it. And so you end up with a working class, if you will, of about 4.5 or 5 million people, out of which the participation rate is around 60%. A very small part of that is actively engaged in high-tech and science. What do we need to do for this to scale? Initially in the book, one of our big questions was, is Startup Nation sustainable? Is it here for good? I think that the, the big challenge going forward is a growth challenge. This is a Jewish country, but it's say 80% Jewish, 20% Arab. And they're basically two big minorities that are less connected to Startup Nation. Arab Israelis don't serve in the military generally, and the ultra-religious Jews they kind of opt out. They believe they should be studying and not take time off. And this is a problem for integrating them into Startup Nation. Going forward, it's critical to bring in these, these minorities and not have them left out just because they're not serving in the military. The Israeli high tech today lacks over 6,000 engineers. And it is a consensus today that the main a human capital resource for, to, to, uh, to bridge this gap is the Arab community and the ultra-Orthodox Jews. Since this country established, we are citizens of Israel and have an equal rights here in Israel. But the Arab community don't involve into the Israeli military. So we don't have the culture of the technology industry in the Arab community. The infrastructure in the Arab cities and villages is like 20, 30 years behind the Jewish cities. Arab family earns half as much as, as the Jewish family earns. 68% of Arab kids in Israel live under poverty line. I mean, this is completely different economies. We live in separate cities. We study in separate educational systems. And out of 120,000 engineers working in high tech in Israel, only 4,000 are Arabs. In 2007, I met Smadar Nehab and Yossi Kotin. We are three founders, and we built the Tsofen organization. The idea of Tsofen was we should build shared society between the Jewish and the Arab through technology. In terms of our objective, we are speaking about integrating 10,000 Arab engineers by the year 2025 and having four uh, high-tech centers in Arab cities. Today we are located in Nazareth and in Kafr Qasem. There we have an accelerator for startups. We are working with the government to establish a high-tech park there and today employ over 900 engineers. More than 100 of them are Jews that are coming every day to work in Nazareth. For a non-Israeli this may sound very normal, but here this is a real revolution. I think there's a great, great opportunity here for the Israeli high-tech. If we can bring it together, I think that's, that's the next high-tech boom. I grew up here in Nebrak in the Haredi ultra-Orthodox education system. Uh, all girls, uh, no SATs or any exam that would allow you to go into higher education. We have a very unique way of life. There are a lot of guidelines, a lot of ways of things that we do. Keeping the Shabbat from Friday night to Saturday night, um, you don't use electricity. Very often in, in the last few uh, decades, uh, it will be the men will keep on going to learn and then the, the women will take care of the income and uh, actually working. I started writing for magazines in Israel. One publisher told me, I don't believe that if you believe in God, you can be an intelligent human being. So. Being an entrepreneur in Haredi and a, and a woman and a mom is, uh, I guess it's challenging. So this is my home office. This is actually a prototype we did for MetLife, which was really cool. We really try to help companies provide mentoring and advice on demand from employees from all levels and all backgrounds inside the company. 
So we just create internal apps for them that help them get the most relevant people, specifically relevant to your issue. You can go into it, you can ask a question or just write about a situation you'd like advice with and get some really good advice from them. Comatech is an amazing organization started by Moshe Friedman. Comatech is integrating Haredim inside established high-tech companies like Google and Microsoft. We, for example, lean on, we sit inside Microsoft Ventures, so I can actually go to someone who works in sales in Microsoft or in development if I have a problem and really get a lot of uh, advice and help from them. It's so successful, they're going to take it and actually apply it all to Arab startups now and afterwards to startups in Israel in general. I, I do think like integration is the key, but I've been told for years now, oh, if only all Haredim would have been like you. And I'm sure that's the case for uh, people of color and for Arabs and for like uh, maybe people of the gay community, but you know, if you've known like my whole family and my whole community, you probably think, yeah, all Haredim are like that. In my dream, and I'm sure in Comatech's dream even more, I see like an integrated society, but sort of like an immigration. It takes like a generation or something like that. Immigrants are always the best entrepreneurs. They can gain a lot from becoming an entrepreneur and can lose little because they don't have usually anything or much in any case. And this country is crucible of immigrants for the last 120 years. And the interesting thing is our two current immigration sources are from within us. These are the ultra-Orthodox and the Arab Israelis. They are immigrating, you know, from their way of life into the high tech and introduce a lot of good and fresh uh, power into this uh, pool. The Israeli army is kind of different from any other armies around the world that is making the Israeli society stronger. We have a lot of programs that are dealing with groups in the Israel society which are not attracted naturally to the IT industry. אז כפי שידוע לכם, צה"ל מגייס מכל, מכל שכבות האוכלוסייה, אבל אנחנו מקבלים משאבים מוגבלים מאוד ויכולים לגייס כמויות מוגבלות של כוח אדם, ולכן אנחנו כחיל המודיעין כל הזמן נדרשים ליצירתיות, לחשוב מאיפה אנחנו מגייסים משאבים נוספים ואיזה אוכלוסיות שעדיין לא גויסו אפשר, אפשר לגייס. ואחת מהאוכלוסיות האלה היא האוכלוסייה של הצעירים על הספקטרום האוטיסטי. I never really knew what it meant for me until I was like 17 years old. Like, I wasn't really excluded from social life, I just had a rough time fitting in. I felt like I should be able to do this. Why am I not able to do this? It was really frustrating for me. As someone who is uh, diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome on the autism spectrum, I was exempted from my mandatory military service. But despite the exemption, I did still want to serve my country. Um, that's the standard, and I wanted to not stick out or be different than anyone else. Having Asperger's syndrome, there are uh, disadvantages and difficulties that are involved in that. Um, there are also other things, other strengths, is very high uh, precision, attention to detail, analytical skills. That is very valuable and important when you're doing uh, this, this kind of work. To me, it was very much insane. It was a completely different experience from what I went through until then, because suddenly I felt like I had a social life. It's very refreshing. It's an absolutely great experience. 
The people that really make the difference in innovation, the people that really make the difference in cyber, in artificial intelligence, in big data and so on and so forth, are pretty unique people. They're difficult to find. It's a great example of how the military is used for many purposes and not directly for security. Now, if you really want to promote this and use this as a segue also to push the economy, now you want to push the innovation centers into those areas where in Israel are considered the periphery. And so Beersheva is about an hour drive from where we're sitting right now, but it's considered far away in Israeli standards. Ben Gurion said that the, the ultimate test of the Zionist movement will be in the Negev. And so the country is now trying to face up to that challenge. I think we had gone through enough iterations on the critical path of how ecosystems are built. Where is the fine line and balance between planning an ecosystem from a government perspective and then trying to quote unquote own it? We're taking a lot of best practices from the last 30 years, starting from 1985, and trying to leverage them in, uh, in Beersheva and in the Negev. We are here at the Advanced Technology Park. Ben Gurion University is just a walking distance from here. It's the third largest university in Israel with uh, now 20,000 students. Besheva was chosen by the government to be a pilot city for health, education and technology. There's huge support from the government of Israel in terms of incentives and, and different aspects. In the last three years, this ecosystem is growing. We attract good companies. We have uh, PayPal here, EMC, Lockheed Martin, Dell, IBM and others. The plan is to leverage the fact that top down there's things that we can do like health and education and housing. If you put all that together, you'll get a new excellence innovation center around Beersheva, which is essential to Israeli livelihood. One of the strengths that we have as a nation is the fact that the military is very central to everything that we do. And so if you take that organization and put it in this other place, good things will happen. And that's the plan. The plan is you push the IDF tech units into Beersheva. That will push everything from beyond the probably 10 kilometer radius that has about 80% of the startups in Israel right now, which doesn't make sense from a national point of view. Increasingly, the Israeli government is trying to trickle this startup nation effect into other cities, but it's, it's very difficult. Most Israelis who work in high tech and in the startup world prefer to be in Tel Aviv and its environs. The idea of whether you can plan an ecosystem is something that many countries in the world are grappling with. There's a fundamental kind of contradiction because government operates top down and startup ecosystems come from the ground up. They're, they're organic. It's very hard for governments to get a handle on how they can be part of something organic. What's interesting is this need to build a place from an idea is very related to startups and entrepreneurship. For the first you know, 40 years of our history, we weren't startup nation. Our, our big pride was we grew our oranges, we made the desert bloom. And there was a lot of innovation in that, but it wasn't high tech, it wasn't what we think of as startup nation. The ethos of the country was very much socialist and they were trying to manage this whole thing from the top down in a way that was totally impossible in a modern economy. People say, well, you know, the Russians were communists, that wasn't real communist. So the real communism in a way was the kibbutz. So the kibbutz is basically a radical social experiment. They were primarily agricultural. Only later they started getting involved in Startup Nation. This kibbutz was one of the three settlements in the south of Israel. This is a shared community. We act like a cooperative. So we don't own anything. All the cars are for the kibbutz members and when we need a car, we just come and we take a car. Basically, that's how things run here. You have an apartment and you have free education for your kids and health uh, care, everything you need, basically. 
We'll stop here for a second. We need to remind ourselves all the time that we are in the middle of the desert. We are very far from the city. I lived in New York, I lived in Tel Aviv for many years. I've been in advertising uh, companies and I had a startup. And I understand the pressure and I understand all the bullshit that you need to deal with in the city. It's all around you. So you deal with that and you deal with that and you go to that and you're in this chaos and you take out money. And at the end, you don't take off your product. You don't do what you have to do. So coming here and setting up my business here, I realized that we have a big advantage being apart from all the, what I call the bullshit. The idea of the hatchery, one of the main points of the hatchery, is to get entrepreneurs isolated a bit, to get them away from the city, away from the temptations that uh, the city holds, get them in an isolated environment where they can really, really concentrate on what's important. Hey, startup maker, if you're still in college or just graduated and got an idea that you think will conquer the galaxy, that's great. You can join the Madgera, a three-month technological boot camp in Israel. Get rid of distractions and daily concerns. Get expert guidance on all aspects you need and essential skills, even bakery if needed. All you need for your idea to conquer the galaxy. Getting here, it's not like a regular accelerator. It's not like a course. If you come to the hatchery, you move here and you live here and you stay here. You don't go to traffic, you don't stand, you don't waste time. So if you need a mentor, he comes here. What I'm selling is peace of mind. If you know that you have breakfast, lunch, dinner, you have laundry, you have a house, you don't need to pay bills, my mind is not distracted. For a startup, it's uh, worth more than money. Innovation and entrepreneurial spirit come, I think, from a few core aspects. Creativity, having the ability to sort of take risks, of course, Palestinians have faced a variety of challenges and great adversity, but our population is extremely young. If they're guided into this field, which they should be, if there's enough counseling to guide people into the right careers where there's a potential for growth, it's limitless um, how we can expand. This project is part of the state building. I'm a strong believer that the occupation will end and we will have our independent free Palestine. And the question in our mind always is, what shape of a nation we will have? This is part of building the nation, only a small part, but it's an important part. The pillars of an important nation is a strong governance, good human and civil rights, and excellent economy and this project is about an excellent economy and about upgrading the standards of living. I am a strong believer that a Palestinian state is in the making. We don't have to wait for the end of the occupation to start fixing our lives and improving the economy. We could start earlier, the occupation is going to end. We deserve to live comfortably, so I'm not looking for any type of people. They could be any Palestinian. It's obviously for Palestinians. Located a half hour from Jerusalem and just 15 minutes from Ramallah is the brand new Palestinian city of Rawabi. It's the first planned city in Palestine. Eventually, it will become home to more than 40,000 residents. In the city center, startups and enterprises are setting up operations. They are ready to rise to meet the challenges of a new and sustainable knowledge economy. The technology sector will be the key pillar of the city's future. Awabi will be a premier ICT hub. Both local and international high-tech firms will find Rawabi a very attractive prospect for them to base large-scale ICT businesses. We are catering to young, educated, high-tech community. To accommodate these people, you have to have a smart, technologically advanced city. A technological place is not just by technology, it's also by the ecosystem you create. So these are restaurants on the plaza, 
So you could just imagine uh, having chairs out here and people just sit down having coffee, eating. Our target is to get high-tech companies. It has not been easy. We are pushing for international companies to outsource to Palestine, to establish R&D facilities in Palestine, to establish testing in Palestine. A lot of them are afraid. They think that bullets are flying all over the place, uh, but uh, we just had some breakthroughs. Uh, there's one great advantage, uh, the proximity of Israel being one of the most advanced nations uh, technologically. All the big companies are in Israel, Google, Apple, SAP, Intel, Cisco, just half an hour to an hour away. And so um, if we could piggyback on that and uh, create jobs, then we have a great vibrant city. This could be the Marshall Plan that picks up the economy in the next 10 to 15 years. We just had the elections in the neighborhoods. We have three neighborhoods now. so. Uh, this is also democracy in the making from the grassroots up. In Palestine and many countries like Palestine, when you give people the opportunities, they excel. What I did is open up the door to the hundreds, maybe thousands of innovative Palestinians. Each one of them is experienced enough to build Rawabi too. It's those people who came up with what kind of a stone, whether to do the arches or not to do the arches, where you put the IIT companies, where you put the homes. It's exciting now to the residents of the city, which I call them the pioneers of the city. Literally, they are the pioneers. Thanks to the internet, they see the west, they see the east, they see everybody advancing, and they're not advancing. They're demanding better, and I believe this is a good response to their demand. How are we? One of the amazing projects in Palestine, amazing talented entrepreneur, uh, Mr. Moshar Masri. I love the whole idea. Just being there, you will feel that you can see the future of Palestine starting from Rawabi. I think it's great, you know. I think, uh, you know, anything which is what the Palestinians are doing for economic development, I think it's very important, you know, because terror and hatred are growing on misery and feeling of unfairness, etc. So the more you close the gap, the better it is. But nothing will replace, I think, a political pact between the two countries, you know, to end this uh, conflict and to let the Palestinians create their own state. And anybody who thinks that uh, economic development can replace the aspiration of the Palestinian people to have their, to control their own destiny is hallucinating. One of the biggest problems we have here is the Israeli settlements. They are ideological settlers that come here believing that this land is theirs, God gave it to them, we should not exist here. And when we started the project early on, they tried to destroy what we're doing. Over time, as they saw Rawabi is in Israeli news, they tried to be accommodating and said, hey, let's do things together. We told them, no, we will deal with Israelis and Israel proper. We will not deal with radical ideological uh, settlers at all. In my personal opinion, they are the biggest obstacle to peace. The more radical, the more organized you are. But the average ordinary Israeli is not radical. The average ordinary Israeli also want to live and would probably prefer to see a prosperous Palestinian state next to them. The notion that we have to make it work because no one else would make it work was not adopted in the Middle East at large in the last 67 years, and it is getting there now. People demand accountability. People like Saeed and Hadi say, I want to make it work. Why not? I'm not going to wait for the political leadership. I'm not going to wait for this or that. I'm just not going to wait. I'm going to make it work. To me, I think that's fantastic. Politicians, take them away and everything will be solved. Even keep, keep the politics for the people in the street and everything will be solved. All the conflicts about the political, who have the case, the Palestinians or the Israelis, with all the globalization in this world, now it's time just to join the forces together, to start working together, and to make your life, your family life, your kids' life, and other lives, and how you are going to change the world. 
how well is Israel positioned to deal with convergence? How well is Israel positioned to you know, borrow these advancements in chemistry and take them to brain research? We are here to build a huge company. We are here to build the largest IoT development platform in the world. Think about like the Matrix movie. We create those you know, streets and, and, and houses which doesn't exist, but he believes that he's walking in the Matrix. That's what we are doing. In the last few years, many Israeli startups are really starting to shift their focus from the U.S. to China, and they're getting much better at knowing what Chinese consumers are looking for.